Um, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Anna Seinfeld, a dear colleague of mine who I've been collaborating with for at least five years now. Um, because we have what some might call competing apps in one bus away in Tiramisu, but we see this as complementary and, uh, and have often gone back and forth with ideas and written proposals and hopefully one day we'll actually get a chance to work together. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I'm moving over just because you're all over on this side, yeah. so I'm going to use this as my program. So, um, so uh, Aaron did all of his degrees at um, UMTRA at the University of Michigan and a postdoc after that at the University of California, Berkeley. He is currently the co-director of the Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center on Accessible Public Transportation, and he's mostly going to talk today about one of my favorite apps, Terramisu. Okay. So with that, I will turn it over. Thank you. So um, I apologize. I'm shifting here because they're all shifting here. So <laughs> oh, that's fine. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the uh, uh, important distinctions I want to kind of make up front uh, is this at all at the end of my name here. Um, the kind of research we do requires a lot of different ex uh, types of expertise and a lot of different uh, uh, help in terms of technical competence. So we have a relatively large team. Um, we also are very active in engaging the local stakeholders and a lot of our funding comes from disability funding source so we engage with a lot of our disability communities um, aside from just interacting with the local transit agency, we do a lot of work uh, with various different uh, stakeholder groups in the, in the community. Um, faculty involved in this work, uh, aside from myself, Anthony Tomasic is a large-scale database and machine learning kind of guy, uh, very interested in, in kind of distributed computing over large systems. Uh, John Zimmerman is HCI design uh, kind of a background. Charlie is also database systems and web apps type stuff, but he's really interested in teaching. So he shows up, throws in a bunch of ideas, and then he turks the problem to us. <laughs> so, uh, but we have a lot of fun with it too. We have a large collection of student staff and postdocs. We even involve a number of different student projects. Um, this is a uh, not complete list of all the people on this. Embarrass this one right here because he's sitting right here. Uh, so Chaya was very active in our project uh, for a while. You were both student and staff, right? Yeah, so um, I was uh, very active, especially in the, the front end client uh, of the app itself. So I want to back up and talk about our core funding. Where do we kind of, with our core motivation, now, unlike most of the people in the transportation community, our focus comes at this from a disability perspective. Uh, we really want to improve accessible transportation for people with disabilities. Now, if you have a severe disability, you can't drive in most cases. Or if you can drive, you can't afford to drive. A, conver a, a conversion van can cost upwards of $80,000. The vehicle's ripped to shreds during the process. You'll probably never sell. So it's a, a pretty steep, uh, Cost, uh, to get your own transportation. Um, really watch, can I, can I? You want me to do last lights? You just I get rid of the ones above you, but we can get rid of the whole room. No, That's no, I don't want to make. People, I don't want people to. Like, yeah, these are questions they don't get right. <laughs> they don't okay, don't never mind. I'll just okay. Go. So anyway, um, the uh, so the the big issue with lack. Yeah, that'll be. Yeah. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> um, okay. So anyway. The, uh, uh, the big issue is uh, with people with disabilities, quite often they'll get a lot of services to set them up in their house, they'll get access to computers and things in their house, but their house will then be in jail because they can't get anywhere from their home. Uh, usually this has to do with sidewalks, but this can also have to do with just inadequate service to their home. If the last mile isn't there, paratransit isn't available, um, various different things like that. And I think we're out of luck. Um, so anyway. The, this boils down to about a third of people with disabilities don't have good transportation at all. Um, does that bother people? Is that better for you? I can't. I can't. Great. That's better. Yeah. Sorry, my slides are a little washed out on the screen. So uh, the other problem is this all not just affects independence and tra transportation independence, but it also affects employment. If you can't get to your job, then you don't have a job. And so therefore, a lot of people with disabilities have job skills, and there's a huge underemployment for people with disabilities, um, but you can't even get a job, and that leads to additional vicious cycles in terms of uh, income uh, and other uh, uh, engagement with society. 
and that the, the lack of employment and the lack of access to transportation um, also triggers a number of problems with isolation uh, in terms of uh, getting out there and talking to people and feeling like you're part of a community. So this is a problem that we set out to solve many years ago using a variety of different techniques. Here we see one of them. Um, one of the problems with transit in particular, uh, at least from a computer science HCI design perspective, is this wicked hard problem. You've got a highly complex environment. Most of you know this when you come from a transportation background. You have a highly complex environment with all sorts of different software stacks of varying levels of modernization. And there's lots of systems out there that are still running uh, operating systems and languages that barely function today. Um, but those are the only options. Uh, because back in the day, especially, software systems were purchased with the mindset of the way concrete was purchased, which is, hey, this will last 10 or 15 years. And how many of you own a laptop older than five years? <laughs> Actually, see, that's pretty good. So anyway, you get the picture as to what it's like. And so that's the first problem in terms of getting the data that you want and being able to make it available. And then you complicate that with the timing problem of you know, buses meeting and connecting and those sorts of problems. The other issue that you run into is confounding data. So in Pittsburgh, one of the busiest lines is the, is the 61s. There are four different 61s, A, B, C, and D. If you get on a 61 downtown, they don't split until you're well past Oakland. You're way outside of, you're way out into the outskirts of town before they split. So if you're trying to say that, you know, which bus did this person get on, just trying to infer it based on their travel path, it'll take miles before you figure this out. And so you run into this problem where these overlapping routes or these routes that are very close to each other and you can't quite figure out what bus someone is actually on. So there's some problems related to inferring actual behavior as well. Also, these overlapping uh, really mucks with your OD uh, uh, travel planning issues as well. Because people can take, you know, for a certain routes in Pittsburgh, you can take any one of like six different buses and still get the OD trip that you want. So uh, this becomes hard to collect a lot of data. So if you rely on automatic passenger counters or fare cards, uh, especially in buses, you only get the fare card data once. Uh, in Pittsburgh, you get it uh, only once, either off or on, depending on where the person is in the system. Um, so you can't kind of get it out of that. Uh, and furthermore, the APC data, um, how many of you are familiar with how APC data works? OK, so not many. Basically, there are light sensors at the doors, and they're just counting how many people are getting on, how many are getting off. It's a very noisy system. If a bag swings through it, as you're walking through, you can trick it. Um, it doesn't know who got on or who got off, so it just knows that the bus got more empty here. So you can't really get a lot of OD out of that. And then finally, there's some really weird things that happen in transit. And Pittsburgh is a prime example of this. Um, there are routes or paths or stops or connections that you'd like to do from an operational perspective that makes perfect sense, but some local constituent is blocking you from doing it. So there are these routes in Pittsburgh, for example, that start way out in the outskirts and kind of squiggle their way in and kind of take these weird routes in. And they'd be much more efficient if you just took a you know, high-frequency bus to one of the trunk lines and just had people connect. But some state legislature person who lives out in that neighborhood wants that direct shot in town, and because Port Authority's funding is tied to the state funding, they can hold an ax over their head and say, you will keep this route. Likewise, an area where you might want to do a transit connection is actually a small little borough where the people who live across the street from the, from the train station are relatives of the police chief, and your, your buses will get ticketed if you pull the buses in and have them wait. Right. So there's all these little nuances that happen, especially uh, in cities, older cities like Pittsburgh, that really muck with your planning of the system. So given all of these types of constraints, we still want to make it easier for someone with a disability to move from one, one place to another on a reliable basis without a lot of surprises. Because surprises is what typically causes problems for people with disabilities. It's those unexpected events and those missed connections that really mess everything so the way we tackle this is through, as I said before, interdisciplinary approaches. Uh, so for example, design skip, there's a lot of design techniques that are very good at tackling wicked hard problems because they're, they're designed to manage these things that aren't really quantifiable, quantifiable or have all these kind of weird soft 
pressures on them, right? So, you know, what is it about the experience of an Apple Watch that makes people want it? Well, that's a very design-driven thing. It's not really quantifiable. So similarly, you can tackle uh, a delivery of service in transit or delivery of information in transit from that kind of thing strategy. But likewise, you can tap the data and you get something interesting out of it and do some valuable uh, interpretations and predictions. So for example, this is all, this is OD data from our system uh, over the course of, I don't remember how many months. Um, uh, but it, you know, we, so we started to use some of this as well from the quantifiable perspective. We started using design techniques. We started doing, we did things like map studies with uh, specific stakeholders. We do the full-blown uh, software architecture stuff. But then we also looked at a couple weird little things like um, helping people who are blind take pictures of transit environments. And then our partners up in SUNY Buffalo, who are all architects and designers and urban planners, they're looking at things like how do you make the bus faster to board for people with disabilities. And they have a full-size Gaelic Phantom uh, with motion tracker systems and lifts and ramps and everything. And they're doing all sorts of research on that space. Um, and some of that stuff gets boarded on the active board of standards. So one approach is we do this interdisciplinary approach. We try and mix all these different disciplines together to get a positive effect on what we want. But the other thing we do is we take a universal design approach. And this is a concept out of the disability community which basically says, um, I'm going to try and solve this problem for people with disabilities in such a way that it has value to everyone else. Right? So, you know, there are certain systems like wheelchairs that those are really going to be kind of narrow niche market products. That's the nature of it. Those are assistive technologies. But there are other systems that you can do that have broad value to large populations and help everyone. Uh, so the curb cuts, so it you know, allows you to enter a street on a ramp from a sidewalk. That's called a curb cut. That's the example everybody gives that is the kind of quintessential urban uh, universal design um, where, you know, if you use a wheelchair, that's the only way you're going to get on and off the curb. But strollers, people with deliveries, kids on bikes, all those other things, those curb cuts matter for them as well. So there's a broad value. That brings that technology into the mainstream market, mainstream budgets, and much larger market penetration in terms of who's using it. Transit's the same way. It's designed to serve everybody. Transit is kind of a universal design solution. So here's an example from Portland Rail where the wheelchair parking location has been designed to kind of cooperate nicely with luggage strollers and bicycles in terms of the way they've set it up and the way the doors have been configured. Likewise, they've put uh, very easy to use gap plates to make it very fast to get on and off the rail, rail buses if you are a person with a disability. Um, likewise, many of us actually have a functional disability in certain conditions. You know, if it's rainy and <laughs> um, if it's rainy and dark and you're you know, trying to get to your bus, you have a kind of a functional visual impairment, right? You've got your hood up, you've got your phone close to your body because you don't want it getting wet, it's dark, your eyes are all kind of getting, you know, all sorts of different problems. So, you, so by design for people with disabilities, to some degree you're able to also support people who don't have disabilities when they're in environments that create functional disabilities. And so this is the approach that we took with Tier Basu. And there's a second reason for why we did this, and that has to do with having the largest possible user kind of user market base as possible. The largest possible user market um, because we wanted to tackle this with a technique that requires a large user market. So, specifically crowdsourcing. So one of the big challenges, as I said, is these surprises, this unknown information, things that people don't have access to. And our thought was. Well, in today's day and age, the vast majority of the population carries around something that's really good at sensing, has internet connectivity, and has a pretty good interface. So it's not that much of a leap to turn this into a mechanism for gathering the kinds of data that people with disabilities need to travel. And furthermore, we can do it in a way that kind of leverages certain ideas in computer science related to machine learning and participatory sensing uh, if you have colleagues over at HCI, these are things that a lot of them are thinking about. Um, and we can tune the information based on your location because not only do these have all the sensing capability, but they have GPS and they have pretty good localization techniques built into them. So we're trying to tackle it using those methods. We have other projects that are looking at the challenge of getting around transit stations. I'm gonna, I talked a little bit about that yesterday uh, at the robotics group. 
So we, as I said, we use an interdisciplinary approach. We started with early kind of design-driven approaches, uh, bringing people in, having them go through charades. We'll be put to this, uh, kind of the term that we use is called speed dating, where we run them through very lightweight prototype ideas, concept ideas, to see what they think about it, kind of get really rapid <coughs> feedback. We test you know, a large number very quickly uh, using these methods. Um, we had uh, uh, people go out and do service blueprinting for, for public transit, um, not just for people without disabilities, but also different service blueprints for different kinds of disabilities to try and understand where the different breakdowns occur and information flow uh, for each disability type or no disability at all, uh, and to understand where potential issues can, uh, start popping up. So we use this to try and guide what kind of transit information system we're going to generate. Our original thought was that people with disabilities want the, the thing they wanted the most was the opportunity to document accessibility barriers in such a way that some remedy could be done. Right? So they document, I just ran into this problem, get that to the transit agency, have something fixed. That was kind of our original thought as to what we would be doing. And we ran uh, a number of different design methods, and what we found was that that was useful and interesting, but there were other problems that were happening that were also, that were also uh, important. And this sort of real-time awareness of what was going on was very important uh, to this community. And specifically, fullness and arrival time. And well, the reasons for this is that uh, our blind participants made it very clear that if the bus isn't coming, they really have no, re no recourse, right? If there's a detour notice posted at a, at a stop, uh, or there's some other announcement that goes out, and they don't, they don't perceive it, they're out of luck. So we had a blind participant who was standing at a bus stop for two hours in the winter because they didn't know that the, that the bus was being detoured that day. Was, and they were after hours, so they couldn't call into the, to the transit agency. So that was an example of that kind of unexpected event, but also the, the part where real-time information would be important. Um, by the way, if you have a disability, your chances of, well, at least your perception of being mugged at a stop is severely higher than everybody else. Carrie did some neat work with the general public showing that real-time arrival information drives down perception of uh, personal risk at bus stops. Um, similarly to people with disabilities. There's also a real risk of standing out at a stop for two hours. There's certain disabilities where exposure to cold weather actually increases your risk of uh, secondary uh, health effects. The fullness data is important to people who really need a seat or use wheelchairs and scooters. Because a full bus means they're probably not getting on, regardless of what the local policies are. Even if the agency has a policy of kicking people off the bus for wheelchair users, the odds of a driver doing that are almost zero. So fullness tells them if they're even going to get on the bus. And the idea was, give us data that's good enough. Perfect would be ideal. It would be great if you could instrument the buses and get everything we need, but good enough is kind of what we need. It's better than nothing. Now, one of our kind of goals, one of the things that kind of a long-term vision of ours, and this is kind of shared with Gary, <laughs> is this idea that um, people should have a stronger sense of ownership in their transit system. They should have pride in it, right? You talk to a Londoner, the underground is kind of a big deal. You talk to someone from Brooklyn, they, they'll tell you exactly which train line they're on, right? You know, you see them even wearing shirts with a number on. <laughs> um, and the idea was, it, 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 this is kind of a long shot in Pittsburgh, but one of our, you know, John had this line, like, we can get people to love transit as much as they love the Steelers, we'll have won. We're going to win, but <laughs> you know, maybe we'll try. Um, and so John is very interested in this notion of, can we create situations where users are increasing the value of the system to fellow users? So can you, as a user, raise the value of your transit agency? And if you think about it, there's already models of this in, in, in the computer and in, in tech industry. You go to Amazon, well, at least in the back of the day, you went to Amazon because of the user reviews. That was the users adding value to Amazon. Right? Wikipedia is another example, but Amazon is probably a better one. Yelp, you know, these sites don't have value without, their, without the user ratings. So can we use the users to kind of add that value into transit information? So we tried this. Um, and we implemented a software called Tiramisu, which in Italian means pick me up. 
Nice. This is what happens when all the good memes are taken, like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, And uh, we designed, so at the time in Pittsburgh, there was no ABL system, there was no vehicle tracking. Uh, they did have GTFS, but they didn't have real-time tracking, and they didn't even own it. Um, and so we said, let's turn the phones into ABL. So when you get on a bus, you say where you are, where you're going, you say how full it is, and you start recording. That data gets dumped up to the server and passed out to everybody else and shows up as real-time data. And fullness. Now we decay the fullness. We don't let the fullness stay your entire trace because we know that it's probably going out of date and obsolete quickly. So after a certain number of stops, we drop the fullness out. So if you use our app, you sometimes will see real-time with no fullness, that's why. Um, if we don't have someone on a bus, but we have, a, we have enough data to be confident about a particular uh, uh, arrival estimate, we can generate historic data. And we'll put that up. And this is all done at the trip level, the individual bus trip. We don't do this by router or by time of day. We just look at the individual trip. And so we deployed this back in 2011. We did a, we did a precursor study actually prior to 2011. Um, but we deployed it to the public in 2011. It's been generally successful in Pittsburgh. Um, for a while, we were the only game in town because we were the only one providing real-time arrival information in Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh eventually bought, Port Authority eventually bought uh, real-time arrival tracking. We'd like to believe that we had some influence on them <laughs> doing that because people were like, this is awesome, why can't we have more? Um, we know that individual riders were saying this, um, but you know, we don't really know whether or not we actually tipped the scales or not. Um, I suspect what may have fully tipped the scales was the county executive getting really pissed after 